The Lord be with you, everyone. And I want to, first of all, quickly thank all of our partners who make this webinar possible every week. Um, our partners have committed to give, and that gives us a budget to work with. And so we present this to the world free of charge, because behind me stand our partners who are making it possible. So thank you, and thank all of you who have sent a one-time offering. That has helped in many, many ways, and I thank you for it. And I want to continue tonight looking at that story of Gideon. We, I talked too much last week, and we came to an abrupt end, but I, I want to look at the end of the story, uh, which is in verse 22, when Gideon saw, that's in Judges chapter 6, and in verse 22, when Gideon saw that he, remember the traveler, was really the messenger of Yahweh, I am, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the messenger of I am face to face. I have seen the messenger of I am face to face. And it's those words that have gotten a hold of me even more so than since last week. And, and so that's what I want to zero in. This which is, and I'll say it right at the beginning, this most wondrous, uh, almost I was going to say incredible reality of this gospel that we are proclaiming that we come face to face with God himself, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. But quickly, let's look at what we saw last week, but only very quickly. It's, it's this young fellow Gideon, and as he comes to out of his wine press, if you remember, and he comes what appears to be a traveler who was sitting under the oak tree with his traveler's staff in his hand, and then there comes this conversation. And in the conversation, uh, Gideon is reminded by this traveler who is really the messenger of I am. And we saw last week that is the very presence of Jesus in the Old Testament. He has not taken our humanity, but he comes in that disguise. He appears as um, a human being and, and is called the messenger or the angel is the um, untranslated word, the, the messenger of I am. And he had greeted Gideon with the words, I am is with you, the Lord is with you. And there it begins, this tirade of negativity out of the heart of this young chap, Gideon. And he goes on to say, not only is everything against us, not only are, are we the slaves of these Midianites who come to bully us every year, not only that, but you talk about me being the deliverer of the people. And if you remember, the exact words could be translated as, excuse me, are you crazy? He said, I come from the smallest family, the most insignificant family in the whole of Manasseh, the tribe, and I'm a nobody. And what it amounts to, he is telling us of his rank unbelief and his brazen, brazen, because he's not um, hedging it. He, he, contradict God's word and says, that isn't so. The Lord is with us? No, he says, not at all. He says, the Lord has abandoned us. That's the word he uses. We're abandoned. He's just left us to die. He, he, he's, he's not the God of love, not the God of covenant. He's the fickle God who's here today and gone tomorrow. Th this young fellow, and certainly his family, and we saw briefly last week how he is echoing what he's heard around the family table this long time. It's, it's darkness, you know, that inner darkness 
the, the inner confusion, uh, the, the fog that is in the mind of humans, the fog of lies, lies of separation. We, we've talked about that before, but it, it's too important not to briefly say it again, that the lie which constitutes the great error that took place in the Garden of Eden, the great sadness that came upon the human race, was the lie of separation. Now, just think about it for a moment. Separation, and it's a lie. It says that God is not here with you. Where is he then? He's up. And if you just think about it, in your own immediate circle, let alone the greater circle of, of those that you are aware of, God is up. They always speak of him as up. And, and it, it, some will even point up as they talk about God. Do you realize that's the essence? That's what Satan did in the Garden of Eden, that God is up, up and away. He's not here. That's the point. He's not here. He's up. And we invented the word secular. And the word secular means where God is not. And so therefore we have spiritual, which uh, means, I suppose, to some people, you go to church on Sunday, that's a spiritual thing. And you read your Bible, that's very spiritual. And you pray and, and, and you go to church on Wednesday, maybe, and that's very spiritual. You see, And you witness to people about your uh, belief in God, and that, that's spiritual. But then you go to work uh, and you, you're up to your ears in whatever you're doing uh, and you go to school and you study and you go to the PTA and you're with the kids and that's all secular. You say, that's my secular job. That's where God is not. That's the See, we have called sin a, a matter of, you know, murder and adultery and all No, the heart, why do you think people do those things? It's a separation. We believe that we're independent on our own, left here, abandoned by God, separate, which of course is causes a separation within us. So we have that weird thing that we talk to ourselves, don't we? Uh, who's talking to who? You say, I said to myself, well, who's the I and who's the self? You must be a split in the middle, you see. And what do we say? We, we, we look at ourselves and we say we're worthless, we're no good, we're stupid. And that, that long list of things that pours out of one side of us to the other side of us. Separation. And then we're separated from other humans. And on and on it goes. Separation. That's the great lie that has made the human race into the mess it is. But it's lie to say that this God who is love, his very being, his, his love is not a lovingness which could have moods attached to it. It, it isn't that if you do something bad, he, he looks away in disgust. And then if you read your Bible for a whole day, well, he looks at you and smiles. That's all lie. That's all satanic lie. He is love. That is all he can be because that's all he is. It's a faithful love. And, and that's what has been lost in the darkness of mankind. Uh, and now he has been replaced by a God, and I say it very carefully, a God that the imagination of separated flesh invented. Worshipping a God that is a product of our imagination. And he's a fickle God. That's the God we expect him to be. That's how m many sermons are preached based on that fact that God has left you. God, God doesn't like what you're doing, so he's angry at you. He's a fickle God. You never know what you're dealing with, what mood he's in. He's a disinterested God. So that what is your biggest burden right now? Well, God's not really interested, so he abandons us when we need him the most. And that's where Gideon was. That, that's exactly where he was. And, and we didn't touch this last week, but add to that, that uh, the, the, the family headed up in Gideon's father, they had 
an altar in a very significant place, right in the center of the ranch, that they had an altar to Baal and Asherah. Now, you might have heard of that uh, demonic couple. Uh, they, they were gods that um, the people worshipped. Uh, they, they were demonic gods. This is pure idolatry. Uh, and Baal and Asherah were basically gods that worshipped sex and also the promise of uh, money and the promise of prosperity and success in, in all your planting and herds and cattle and so on. Uh, and they, they were right there in the middle of the ranch. And so they said, well, we, we worship God. We worship I am. He's the one who led us out of Egypt and so on and did all his mighty works. And we worship him. But <clears throat> we hedge our bets uh, and we have this other God here. And, and so God had become, well, one of a number. He was just, well, we'll try him. If he doesn't work today, we'll try this one. They're in a hopeless mess, this family. Um, and then their outlook on life, which comes out with him saying, I'm so insignificant and I'm part of this insignificant family. You know, you, you listen to him, the chap is hopeless. He's got no, no expectancy of any change of any kind in this oppressing world he's living in. He's got a totally negative outlook on life. You know, he's the sort of fellow I don't want to hang around for all he's talking about is what is wrong in the world and what is wrong with his family and huh, darkened in mind and thinking and outlook, blind to the reality of who God really is, ignorant, all those words could be used of Gideon and his family. Okay, can you, can you sink that in? That, that's this fellow who is coming out of the wine press where he has been threshing his wheat because he's hiding it there from those bullies, the Midianites. And as he comes out right there, just in front of him, a big oak tree and under the oak sits, as I say, no, it's really Jesus, but he's disguised, for he's not yet assumed our humanity. But he looks like a traveler, looks as if he's just been walking a long way. Now he's sitting under the tree and he's got a staff, you know, the big walking stick you use when you're doing mountain walking. And But he is God. And remember, the Holy Trinity cannot be separated. And so where God the Son is, Jesus, there is God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so the Trinity is here, but God the Son, disguised as a traveler, I am himself is there. Now, now hear this. Don't, don't, don't run ahead of me. Hear it. This ranch where there's the demonic pagan idol of Baal and Asherah, right in the side, I mean, sitting under that tree, you can see it. And the negativity of Gideon, his bitterness and the way he perceives God, as he imagines now him to be, has treated them. All that. And in the middle of that, Jesus is sitting. Now, do, do you hear me? Here is Gideon, and I've said it more than once, out of the wine press. What do you do in a wine press? You take grapes and you crush them until the juice comes out. And what do you do with wheat, threshing wheat? What does that mean? It means you beat it uh, until all, all the kernels of corn are out. It is impossible that as Gideon has been in that place of crushing grapes and threshing the wheat, that that's how he feels this God that he's made up in his own mind is treated them. Do you understand? We're being crushed 
We've been abandoned. We've been beaten up. And he's feeling it. The aloneness of that, the anger that such a God, as he's made up in his own mind, would be so unfaithful and fickle and abandoning them. And so it is that when he crawls out of that place, he's ready to take on this traveler who has announced to him the Lord is with him. I don't know if this is already getting into your heart, but there in the middle, feel it, in the middle of the darkness in which Gideon lives, that is a darkness both created by lies and is full of lies, lies and idolatry. And in the middle of it, sitting there in the middle of it, is I am the God who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and appearing to Gideon as this traveler. He's in the middle of it, and he's submitting to, yes, you heard me, submitting to, and he's receiving the anger and the bitterness of Gideon. Do, do you hear me? What I'm saying is I don't see one jolly thing on that ranch that would bring God to have any interest in the place. At least, if I were to use my flesh imagination, if I were to use the same imagination that Gideon used, I would say this God would have no interest in coming here a place where we contradict him, a place where we openly say we don't believe him, that he's abandoned us, this place of lies, separation, and sticking there in the middle, our idol of Baal. And yet instead, we find that this God, the real God, is sitting in the middle of that situation, disguised as just a traveler, so that he doesn't cause any fear in Gideon. He looks like just a passing guy. And he sits there and he takes it. Gideon puts it in his face. The humility of God. Do you ever think of this? The humility of God that he sat there and he took everything that was not only in sight, took everything, not only that which was the very atmosphere of the place, but he, he took a verbal beating from Gideon. He sat there. He received it. Or as I said a moment ago, he submitted to it. Please understand, this is so important. You see, so many people, and I'm sure some of you listening to me as we keep talking, the, it, it's this other God that came along with the separation lie that's been invented in our head. And that guy is up and away, and his name is Almighty and Sovereign. And you have to grovel at his feet and say everything right. That's such a lie. The real God that comes to us in Jesus is the God of humility who sits down inside our darkness. He sits down inside our idolatry, inside all our insults that say he has left us and abandoned us and doesn't care. And he sits there and he submits to that. When is it going to dawn upon our Western world anyway that he doesn't come to judge? I know that for some places there'd be nothing left to preach if we understood that. Jesus does not come to judge, and his Father certainly doesn't. He said he gave all judgment to the Son, and the Son doesn't condemn, doesn't judge. So he doesn't. Look at what he says. Look at what he says to Gideon. He doesn't condemn them for where they are. He keeps telling them that the Lord is with them. And he doesn't come as that exalted prince sitting 
on top of the jolly oak tree, demanding they grovel and glorify him and worship him. Gideon, fall on your face, put your nose in the dust. No. Did you realize you've heard all of that? You're supposed to bend your body and say, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy, I'm no good. Why well, you try to find that in the Bible. That's not the real God. The real God isn't like that. Instead, he doesn't tell Gideon to fall on his face. Instead, I am God, I am, desires a face-to-face -face conversation. And what does it mean, just before we get to it, really, but what is face-to-face? -face? Well, you, you've got to be on the same level. Do you, do you understand that? If I'm having a face-to-face -face conversation with you, it means we are face-to-face. -face. It means we're on the same level. So this idea that God being so far up, 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 no, His love desires us that he comes face to face. He comes where we are on the same level. He comes down to where Gideon is, physically under the oak tree, so that when Gideon comes out, they'll be standing literally face to face. But he comes face to face with Gideon's darkness. Do you understand that? He comes face to face with the anger and the bitterness of Gideon. He comes face to face with the lies that God is a separate God. He's not here. He's abandoned us. He's fickle and so on. He comes face to face with that. And he takes it. He's a self-giving love. He is in his very being kindness and gentleness. He listens to Gideon with no condemnation. He submits to the accusation and contradictions of Gideon, to his anger and his fear that is behind his anger. Do you understand how safe God is? Do you understand that when you have screamed your pain and anger and fear at him, he has not left you, he has not condemned you, he just puts his arms around you and says, I'm here. No. Face to face, just where we are, and submitting to all that we say, See, he, he doesn't send a message to Gideon saying, you've got to find your way back to God. If you fast and pray and do all this other stuff, then maybe, maybe, maybe we'll have a talk. Maybe. I've heard that preached. But instead, the real God is the God who initiates. He doesn't call us to try and find him. He says, I'm here. I've never left you. He's the God of love coming right where we are. And, and he describes himself as finding us in our darkness. Because the darkness blinds us to who he really is. So who he really is comes in our darkness to find those who don't even know they're lost. So he doesn't say... You are wrong, Gideon. When are you going to listen to me? No. Rather, the gentle voice of love basically was saying, I've come to where you are. I've come inside your darkness, inside your anger and your pain and your fears, and I've come to take you home, take you home into the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Come into the light of truth. And from there, boy, do I have plans for you. What a life it's going to be. Hmm. See, Gideon had lived in the darkness, hearing that he was insignificant, that he was worthless, that he was unwanted by God. And now he's being gently, and I have to keep saying that word because there's nothing harsh here. It's a gentle drawing to the love and the love which is light and the light which is truth. 
into an unimaginable future of a new possible. So for all that Gideon had to say, I am responds quietly. If you read it a thousand times, you'll begin to feel the very tone and atmosphere. It was gentle, it was quiet, it was tender, but emphatic in planting the truth that canceled the lie. He said, the Lord is with you. What, what is going on? What's going on when he comes right into that darkness and submits to what Gideon is saying? When he comes into our darkness and when we say, if you look in retrospect, some shocking things to God, and yet he, he didn't get mad. He didn't strike you dead, did he? No, that's the other God, the God of imagination that Satan invented, the God who hates you and just waits for times to smite you. Oh, he loves it. No, the real God loves you. And the real God, what's he doing? He is, and hear me carefully, forging a relationship with the real Gideon. You see, if Gideon had realized he was talking face to face with God, he would have put on his Sunday best mask and all that funny language people use when they talk to the God of their imagination. If you notice that, pe people put on that strange English that we used to speak in England, I don't know how long ago, these and thys and thous. Uh, and it's a tone, it's a twang, it's a religious thing. You know, immediately we've dropped being the real us and we're now presenting ourselves in our Sunday best to God and we're talking to him, the Almighty. No, Gideon didn't know it was God and so he just lets it all hang out. Uh, and, but in submitting to that, you see the real God comes to his goal. What was his goal? To enter into a relationship with the real Gideon. And the real Gideon's in the depth of darkness and perceived separation, ignorance, idolatry, pain, anger, fear. How's God going to get into that with Gideon, with you, with me? By just submitting to us in our pain, let, letting it out and receiving it. And what's happening? We've let him into it. And now he's there sitting with us in the middle of our pain. Oh, what a, what a God, what a God. He, ca he came, have you noticed it in, in the scripture, the questions of God? I, I've, I've mentioned it for years because it's fascinated me. He questioned. Right, right at the beginning, he said to Adam, where are you? And I, I want to say, you know where he is. What do you say that for? And that's followed up, he says, and what have you been doing? Well, he knew what he'd been doing. Why does he say that for? For this, that we're talking about. Come on, Adam, be who you truly are right now. Off with the mask, tell him. And he submits to it and he gets inside us. Now he's there with us in the middle of our pain because that's what love does. Do you remember the road to Emmaus? We've talked about that, where, where the two disciples are going home after the crucifixion. And as far as they're concerned, life has ended. It's all over. It's finished. There's no hope. They can hardly face their neighbors. And Jesus, risen from the dead, and like, like under the oak tree, they, they didn't recognize him. Only this is Jesus in our flesh. And he comes and he falls in step with them. And he says, you look so unhappy. Well, what's the matter, fellows? And, and they say, are you the only person in Israel that doesn't know what's happened this weekend? And then he says, what things? Haven't you ever asked? Jesus, all the things were about you and you were there and you're saying what things? Notice he didn't say, I don't know. He just said, what things? That is, tell me, tell me. And it all pours out. And in their case, again, the, the, there was anger, there was fear, and there was hopelessness, uh, uh, despair. And Jesus just listens. 
and in listening he gets inside it and from inside he can reveal the, the, the truth and heal them. That's the way love works, not like this other monster god that crushes you underfoot because you've got a look on your face. No, the face of the real God, he, he looks at us. And that's right, in the middle of the conversation, it says he turned, the, the angel of the Lord, turned and looked at Gideon, which means he must have been slightly turned away. But now it's full face, full face. And, and you see, when, when he looks at us, and at this point, Gideon does not show any indication that he really knows what is happening quite. Although at that turn, the conversation begins to come to a conclusion very quickly. Something happens when, when he looks at me. What do I see? I see the face of the real God. But I don't want you to think that that means you're going to see bright lights and lightning and bling from heaven. Um, no, it will be a, the most ordinary thing like this, sitting under a tree looking like a traveler, walking down the road looking like a traveler. He seems to be into that. You, you can be, and I'm speaking at a very deep experience here, you can be sitting in a moment of grief and pain and fear and why and where and what. And then you realize, and you can't say when the realization started. You find yourself, you're already in the middle of it, when you realize there's something else afoot here. And you are waking out of a sleep, a deep sleep, a dangerous sleep. But you're waking up and you're becoming aware, in a way you hadn't been before, aware of who God really is. And in the same breath, you're becoming aware of who you really are, as Gideon was waking up. And at the same time, uh, the dawning awareness of the way things really are. Do you know what I mean? I, I want to hold it. It's not some bolt of lightning. It, it's not some divine shazam. It, it's so quiet. I, I'd, I'd even use the word sneaks up on us. And I want to emphasize, you don't know when it begins. You only realize when you're in the middle of it. That, and that's what this means, the face of God. It means the immediate presence of God, but down to our level, you see, looking at us face to face, which means he's not going to frighten us. He, he just, he is, he's there, and we begin to be aware of it. I, I received a fantastic letter this week from someone here in Texas who, who spoke of, of beginning to listen to what we're saying on these webinars. And, and, and it was put that she listened and listened and listened and listened and then suddenly realized that she was realizing what we were saying and, and seeing the love of God and seeing this God who is revealed in Jesus. And that's the way it is. I can't give you the time. I can't tell you the how. All I know, I'm waking up and I realize I'm in the middle of this. And I, I realize that I'm, I'm seeing and knowing God as I've never quite known him before. He has discovered himself to us in the face of light and love. And in that face, of God, of beauty, of love, of gentleness and kindness, fear disintegrates. The love streams from his face, from his presence, and it disintegrates all our fear. And <clears throat> now you've got to hear this, faith begins to rise, and the faith comes from the face, the presence of God. 
for he is original faith. Did, did you get that? I, I don't know if you realized I just contradicted an awful lot of what's being said. Because everything I was raised with, maybe you, not you, but I, I was raised with, if I had enough faith, I could make God come to my porch, come and sit in my living room, you know, in, in that sense of his presence, you know. Another way of saying it in today's modern church, if you had enough faith, if, if you had really worked your spiritual things, like Bible reading and prayer, then you'd have revival. Well, that didn't work out too well, did it? Um, it's been, how many years do you have to go? Anyway, um, that's not the case. It says here in, in the scripture that the faith that happened in Gideon happened because of God's initiative. He came where Gideon was, where there was no faith. And he listens and submits to Gideon's words, which had no faith in them. But as becomes a realization, the awakening that this is not a traveler, but is, is in fact the very face of God that has now turned and looked at him, faith happens. Faith comes from God. It does not try to get God. Did you get it? <laughs> Faith is, it's got nothing to do with you trying to get God to come or get God to do something. No. Faith originates because he has come and you've suddenly woken up to that and to see him, his presence in, in your spirit eyes, means that faith rises with it. And then repentance, you know, that terrible word. I wish we could find another word because the, the Greek word means simply a radical change of mind, nothing to do with doing penance. And, and, and so it's a radical change of mind. Where did that change of mind come from? Which obviously came to Gideon. It was in the love, the hope, the love hope look of God's face. So your faith and radical mind change comes from the God who comes to you first. Your, 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 yours is a response to him that originates in him. See, you couldn't change Gideon with a threat. You couldn't say, if you just keep talking like that, boy, you're going to no, no, no. God doesn't do that. He lets you talk. He wants you to talk so he can enter into your real heart and fill you with love and light. A debate wouldn't have changed Gideon. He was too hurt. He was too in, into his absolute belief that they were forsaken and abandoned. No, debate doesn't do it. God never debates people. Nor a confrontation simple. It was the Lord turned and looked at him and Gideon began to wake up. Or you could even say he began to melt and all his fears disintegrated before the look. And he says, I have seen God face to face. It's the climax of the story. So what does it mean really? I've been sort of hinting at it. In the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, they didn't have a word for presence. So you couldn't say, I was in the presence of God. There was no word for that. Their word for presence was face. And, and so face, and I, I kind of like that better than the, the simple, more abstract word of presence. It's hard to put a form to presence. But face? Face is the focus of a person. You know, you can't hide who you really are. Your, your face almost has a mind of its own. It will tell the truth concerning who you are. You, you, you understand, you can be saying words, but I'm watching your face and your face is telling me I don't believe a word I'm saying. See, face is a focus of a person. In a person's face, you see their character. The very lines of a person's face. 
have been etched by their character. Your emotions. You don't have to tell me you're upset. You don't have to tell me you're happy. You don't have to tell me that you're tense and fearful. Your face just does that without your permission. Shows all over your face. All your intentions, all your desires, they all have their way of showing on your face. So when the scripture says face, and incidentally, many times the word face in the Old Testament has been translated by our translators as presence. But it, I say again, it should be face. It describes the person that is immediately present to us. See, your face it is not a book that's written because there's a finality to that. You know, the book is written. It's not going to be changed. It's written. And if, you're, if we're talking about a book about God, well, there's a, it's a solid, static, sort of dead thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I like to read the book that he gave us, but the presence is the living, immediate. Now, it's not something that's written and done and is just hanging in front of me like dead solid. No, it's a now relating dynamic presence. You, you don't have a piece of paper that describes your best friend. And every time they show up, they hold it in front of them so you can read their resume. No, no, the face, face is how they is right at this microsecond. And it's now coming through their face. It's a relating dynamic presence. It's not a letter or a text, a phone call, or even a picture. All those things have their place. But face means we're here. And the words face to face means we're together on the same level, talking into each other. Now do you understand what it means, the face of God? It's God himself now in my presence to his presence, my face to his face. And he loves me and his humility has brought him to me eyeball to eyeball. And he wants me to talk even though it's insulting and all my feelings that I would, I'd, I'd, I'd never mention them in church because church is the most unreal place on earth. No, it, I, this, I, I let it out and I discover he's not mad at me. He gets inside that and inside my darkness, that's where he loves me and comforts me and enlightens me. Huh. When he saw the face of God, every question that Gideon had just fell away. They'd not really been answered as such. There was no debate. It was just that when he saw who the real God was, there's nothing more to talk about. Because that face of God conveyed to him hope and strength and love. You see, the Old Testament, and I'm just going to mention this, but it, it's, it's big, really. The Old Testament is, is the ongoing story that begins with the first humans, and it's the ongoing story of humans who are coming out of the darkness. They're coming out because right from the very beginning, the God that we love and worship is the one who came into our darkness. He didn't judge them in the Garden of Eden. I know you've heard that, but he didn't. Read it. Read it for yourself. He didn't. He loved them and told them how he would deliver them. No, it was mankind who judged God, at least the God they imagined him to be. But the, the story is that God came into our darkness and the whole of the Old Testament is the story uh, of mankind gradually coming out of the darkness. They were so deep, so deep in darkness. And they're dragging with them all their distorted ideas of God. And they're dragging it all with them, baggage. And they lived waiting with promises that they really didn't understand. And also promises they couldn't lay hands on because they were promises of a better time in the future. And so when something like this happened to Gideon, well, that was once in a lifetime. And, and it would be called a day of visitation. Uh, 
It was such a visitation. I mean, in that sense, we don't expect it to happen in our lifetime again. That uh, when it was over, and you'll read it down there at the bottom of the story, that Gideon built a memorial to it. It was, you know, on this place, on this day, this is where I saw the face of God. And um, they, they lived on those visitation days, which are the stories throughout the Old Testament. It's the expression that people use today, God showed up. Well, you could use that in the Old Testament because it was, the whole of the Old Testament is a series of stories of these visitations of God. God showed up in the middle of their problems. But we've come to the New Testament. Did anyone tell you? Things changed. Jesus, I am, has come into our humanity. He took on a body exactly like mine, exactly like yours. And the gospel is the announcement of a new kind of relationship, a new kind of relationship beyond comprehension, because in actual fact, we relate more to the Old Testament where God shows up. That's why it's used in a gazillion of our churches today. But if you say God showed up, it means you haven't gotten to the New Testament yet. Do you realize that? Yes, you heard me. If we use the expression or think in terms of God showing up, of visitations, it means we have not yet heard the gospel. Because the gospel is the goodest news you'll ever hear. It is the announcement of a new kind of relationship that has burst into our darkness in the person of Jesus. And it's the announcement of every promise fulfilled. It's a new day and way of being human. And it's a time to explore that. We're no longer waiting to get to God. We are there in Jesus. We are there. We're not trying to get to him. We're not waiting for him to show up. He's here. And the New Testament word is in the face of Jesus Christ. It says the glory of God has come to us in the face of Jesus Christ. So in that sense, although he is with us, but that with has now taken on a vast new dimension. With means he's face to face with us. With means he has come inside of us without displacing us. And we live together in the same body. And he is all he is into me. Huh. So there's no more memorials because we're not talking about when he showed up. We're talking of a residency. We are his address. He settled into us. The face of God in the face of Jesus Christ is now one with my spirit and with yours. So he's not walking beside us. Wondrous though that was. And there is a sense in which he didn't stop walking beside us, but he now walks beside us from inside. He lives in our inner core. He's become our very life source. Did I say he came down to the level of Gideon? Do you realize he has come down to level his face with your face? so that he has actually taken up residence inside your humanity. This is the stoop of God. This is the humanity of God. He has actually come, not only to look at us in the face, but to his face in my face, his face in my spirit. He dwells within us. One of these days we should talk about Jesus kneeling at the feet of the disciples and washing their feet. Isn't that incredible? I mean, can you take it in? It would take more than an hour to take it in. The God who created the cosmos 
is now kneeling at the feet of the disciples to wash their feet. And he has knelt at our feet, submitted to us that he might come inside of us and be the fullness of himself inside of us. My assistant associate, Andrew Colony, gave a tremendous insight. I'd missed it, but he gave it the other day. He said when John, do you remember, saw the, the glorified Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, he says, John fell at his feet as one dead. Do you remember that? But then it says, and Jesus put his hand on him and says, fear not. And Andrew pointed out, if he was laying down on, on his face and Jesus is standing, if Jesus put his hand on him, it meant that Jesus knelt down beside him and put his hand on him. And the fear not was not a big rumbling thunder. It was a whisper in John's ear as Jesus put his face next to his and said, fear not. Isn't it incredible? This is your God, you see. This is your God. And I, I speak to I know, I speak to some of you that are in pain, anger, bitterness, darkness, confusion. You hardly know who God is. That doesn't matter. You're on a journey, and He's already in your life, you see. He's in every one of our lives. He's there. He's come in the person of Jesus into us through the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so we're, we're, we're blind, and we're ignorant, and in our darkness, it, uh, it's okay. You're on a journey, and He... He's already joined himself to your journey. He's all, in fact, he is your journey. And in your darkness, he's loving you. You're safe. You're included. You're in. Listen to it. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus, the out, outspeaking uh, of the Trinity. And, and the Word was with God. And that word with in the Greek language is uh, toward, face to face, you see, with God. So God the Son, face to face with God the Father. And then he says, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. This, he's God, the creator. In him was life. He's the origin of life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in our darkness. Why? Because the light came into our darkness. Not by our invitation, but love brought him in. And the darkness didn't comprehend it. We didn't have a clue what was going on. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man, so you can't exclude yourself. He enlightens every man and woman because he loves us. And the Word became flesh, flesh, our humanity. He dwelt, and our Bible say among us, but the Greek there is inside of us. And we saw his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the gospel. But what about this one? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, The God of this age, the one that we call Satan, which would be better called the accuser, the divider, the murderer, the destroyer, has blinded, that's what I've been saying, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, he made his light shine inside of our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the face of God. He is everything that God is. You get it? He's not just the super nice guy. Jesus is not just the goodest man you've ever heard of. All that's far below what he is. 
He is not just the most marvelous prophet you've ever heard. No, no, no. Jesus, it says, is the face of God. And in that face, we confront the glory of God. Jesus is, I am. He said, he, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. Please understand, Jesus is not a messenger from beside God. He is not a somewhat sub-God that came to fix something to pacify the angry old God in the sky. No, Jesus is God. He is God with the Father and with the Spirit. And he has now joined himself to our humanity. And in that flesh and blood and bone humanity, with our desires and emotions and imagination and mind, he has come on the same level with us. Like I said a few weeks ago, the unnoticed God. Oh, I mean, let that sink in. The unnoticed God on the same level with us. And it's love that brings him here. He wants a relationship with you that is 1,001% real. So he comes on the same level. So he can get inside of us. Bring his salvation. The stoop of God. Stoop down. He... Okay, get this. He who stands on the same level, God the Father, God the Son, one God in the Spirit. We, we read it, you know. He is the Word who is with, toward the Father, face to face with the Father. Okay, he never ceased that. Never. That's who he is. He lives and moves face to face with the Father, with the Spirit. But he came, he came to be face to face with you so that you might be elevated in union with him to be face to face with the Father. That's the gospel. That you joined into Jesus, are joined into face to face with the Father in the Holy Spirit. That's where you are. You say, I don't feel like that. I wasn't talking about your feelings. Your feelings are just like the weather in Texas. And, and so they're, they're useless. Never bring them up. I don't care how you feel. They up and down, chemistry, time of the month. I mean, forget it. No. Truth. Truth is that Jesus, who is God, the face of God, has come where we are, sitting under our oak tree, our wine press, meeting us, coming inside of us. And inside of him, we are then with him, face to face with the Father. And that's what he's done. And that's who you are. And my prayer right at this minute for you is that the Holy Spirit will open your inside eyes and you will wake up and realize where you are and who He is inside of you. And you will discover then that you are the beloved of the Father, that you are one with the Son and all in the unity of the Holy Spirit who is the organizer of the party of God's celebration and joy that you've woken up. I'm going to quit there, and would you believe it, I haven't really finished. Not really. So I might finish this next week, or we might call it quits. But what I just said, that's it. And if you didn't get it, then listen again and again and again, like the lady who wrote my letter. In one of these hours, you're going to realize that it is so. And the gospel will have made his home 
known to you, and his home is you. And now the blessing of God, who is almighty love, light and life, may that glorious God, that most joyous God, that gentlest God, tenderest God, bless you. And in blessing you, awaken you to the knowledge of who you truly are in the beaming light of his face. That's the way it is. Amen.